All right, so uh, welcome to Call the Doctor. Uh, let's see. All right, um, everyone see my screen? Yep. All right, uh, so today I'm gonna be talking about the new, uh, uh, well, feature that was technically new in 114.0, but it's really kind of out of experimental status in 114.1. Uh, it's selection in vector IO, often sort of just uh, quickly, uh, let, abbreviated is just selection IO, but it, often it means both. Um, and so what is selection IO? Uh, so um, you may be familiar with the HDF5 uh, virtual file layer, the VFL or VFD virtual file drivers, uh, which is basically the, the HDF5 library will take these commands for, you know, write to a data set, create a group, et cetera, and translate it to a bunch of uh, offset and length calls, like uh, uh, offset length buffer uh, calls. And it'll, you know, and that means to write this, uh, this many bytes from this buffer to this uh, location in the file, right? Uh, and so the the way it, it does this, and then and then you have this virtual file driver which takes these offset length buffer uh, triplets, and it actually performs that I/O. Uh, you know, it could just be a call to you know, POSIX call or something like that, uh, or it could be something more complicated. Um, and so that works. Uh, you know, it works all right for the most part. Um, but if you have, in some cases, if you have like a very complicated I/O that uh or or something like you select a column of a 2d data set then the library has to make one call after the other like write four bytes here then write four bytes you know 20 bytes later then four more bytes 20 bytes later and so on uh, which can obviously be very very inefficient um uh and uh <clears throat> um so the exception is the built-in mpio driver uh has this uses this undocumented back channel that it, it basically the library constructs an MPI data type or two MPI data types and, and stuffs them in into an undocumented property on the DXPL and, and then the uh, MPIO driver knows to look for that. Uh, but you know we want to be able to have uh, other file drivers uh, <clears throat> be able to get uh, non-contiguous IO commands with a single call. So that they can do something more intelligent than just calling read, uh, you know, a thousand times in a loop or whatever. Uh, so here's a sort of a visual example of what I was just talking about. Uh, so you say you have a, a data set with a chunk data set with four chunks, uh, which would be like a 10 by 20 data set and five by 10 chunks. Uh, and then you're uh, selecting the first three columns of each chunk. Uh, and so if you want to read or write uh, this selection, uh, then the, you know, in the API, you pass, uh, you know, file selection, that's just kind of two blocks here. Uh, and then you pass one buffer, but then the library has to translate that into 20 different calls. And of course, if you scale this up to, you know, a thousand by 20 or something like that, or, or you know, 10 by 2000, then it gets to be very, very large. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, 20 calls is one call for this row, one call for this row, one call for this row, and so on. Uh, so, you know, to sort of expand on motivation for uh, why we want to improve on this, we, we want to be able to pass the entire opera IO operation in a single call back to the file driver. Uh, and so we want to give as much information as possible about the IO to the file driver so that it can make the most intelligent decisions uh about how to actually perform the io uh which may be more intelligent than just write one block at a time uh and it also on the by the same token it sort of gives third-party file drivers uh or you know other built-in file drivers the uh uh the same tools as the mpio driver currently has uh so unless it levels a playing field sort so to speak um so one way that we do this is vector io and this is uh, pretty simple it basically just vectorizes the existing calls um so again you get a file property list uh, and then you get this count parameter which is the length of all these uh these other parameters uh, so types isn't that important but it's like you know 
raw or made it raw data or made data uh but it'll be unused most of the time um addresses uh so offsets it's called addresses here uh sizes like io sizes and, and bytes and then buffers and so and so in in this case it'll be a single read vector right vector call with a uh, count equals 20 then then the addresses will be this address and this address and this address and this address and this address, this address and this address and so on and then the sizes will all be three times whatever the length of the element is and the buffers will be pointers into the uh the read or write buffer uh that into the you know the appropriate locations depending on the uh uh memory selection and uh and is currently used in the library uh for collective metadata rights so when you're <clears throat> performing metadata rights in parallel it'll sometimes uh do that right collectively and it'll you in in that case uh you know, it'll, they'll be written collectively by all processes. And in that case, the uh, the library will use vector IO to pass it to the file driver. Um, and then there's selection IO, which uh, again, similarly, it allows the entire IO operation to be passed. Uh, but instead of just a, a bunch of vectors, uh, like a, arrays of, of offset length pairs, offset length buffer triplets, uh, it passes HDF5 data space selections for both the file space and the memory space uh, and then the offset uh file offsets and buffers that those selections are relative to essentially uh and then also the element sizes because the selections are in terms of elements not bytes so you need to pass the element sizes which would be you know four for a normal integer and so on uh and again we have the file in in this case we only have a single type uh for the entire io uh, then the count and that's the number of uh, selections it's not the number of blocks it's the number of selections and memory spaces file spaces and in many cases count will just be one but in this case because there are four chunks the count is four it's it's one count for each chunk um so yeah and uh each each space will be just kind of like uh, the selection will be a uh, five by three block uh and then the offsets will be the the start starting point of the chunk and then the buffers will be again depending on the uh they'll be calculated depending on the, uh, the memory selection uh so um so this is currently it's it was implemented in experimental form in 1.14.0 it was off by default but you could use an environment variable to turn it on to play around with it uh but it's fully released in 1.14.1 with uh with HDF5 APIs to turn it on and off uh, and more features, uh, and it uh, supports many, but not all use cases. We'll talk about more about that later. Uh, it fully supports multi data set IO, which I talked about a few weeks ago, uh, and is another new feature in 1.14. Uh, so you can, it'll, the library will build a selection IO uh, operation that spans across multiple data sets if you ask it to. And <clears throat> It also enables a new feature, uh, parallel collective IO with type conversion. Until now, if you wanted, if your data set had type conversion, type conversion, if your data reader write operation in include type conversion, then you cannot get collective IO. Uh, so if you want to use selection IO, uh, here are the requirements. So if you you can if you turn it on uh, with HIP set selection IO, uh, it will be used as long as none of these cases uh come to pass so if the data set is not contiguous or trunch I, if it's external um and i would or or uh compact and i believe with virtual it depends on the underlying data set um but i i it, it won't stride it won't stride a selection io operation across different virtual data sets I, I don't believe so um if it's a contiguous data set with a sieve buffer, uh, it'll disable selection IO. Uh, if the file page buffer is enabled uh, or the data set uses filter, data filters or compression, um, if the data set chunk cache is going to be used, depending on the size of the chunk and, and the size of the chunk cache and so on. Uh, and if the type conversion or background buffer is too small, and if any of these things happen, then it'll disable selection IO and it'll just fall back to sort of the scalar uh, IO um and many of these are not an issue in parallel uh, including i believe sieve buffer page buffer 
uh, and usually the chunk cash isn't an issue in parallel. parallel. Um, so, and if you don't do anything with HIP se set selection IO, uh, then it's sort of in the default state and in the default state, it only turns it on if, if all these, you know, if none of these things disable it. And if, uh, if it's supported by the file driver, if the file driver has a vector of selection IO callback, uh, and for, and if the, in a special case of, if you're using the MPIO driver, uh, it'll only be turned on if you're using type conversion. Uh, and also none of these things happen uh, because we're just uh, by default we only turn it on if there's a benefit uh, and because the MPIO driver has this back channel that is still in use uh, there's it, you only get a benefit with the MPIO driver right now if uh, if there's type conversion and if the file driver does not support selection IO uh, but it's still turned on either through basically through this thing uh then the library will will still treat it as a selection io operation until the very bottom and then it'll uh translate it from selection to vector uh, or scalar to make the the callback right. um so now i'm going to talk more about the new collective type conversion feature which is enabled by selection io um so again until now uh type conversion uh, would prevent collection collective IO. So if if you tried to do collective IO, but there was type conversion, it would fall back to independent. So each rank would do their IO independently, uh, no coordination among the processes, and it would do the uh, uh, the it would blur, break the IO into contiguous blocks, which could be you know very slow. And also because of the type conversion was by default very small, the the blocks couldn't be large, even if your selection was contiguous. Um, so, and we, we've, again, we've implemented selection or collective type conversion using, using selection IO. Uh, so the, uh, instead of, uh, a bunch of just, you know, single blocks, it, it again, packages it into uh, a single selection IO call, uh, where the selection is to the, uh, type conversion buffer. So one thing, one major limitation to keep in mind is that the type conversion buffer must be large enough to hold the entire IO. Uh, and that's also true with the background buffer. If you're using, uh, you know, a type that needs a background buffer, like uh, compound types, certain compound types. Um, <clears throat> and so to, to make sure that the buffer is large enough, you can use HIP set buffer, and you can use that to either set a size, a maximum size in, in and pass these as null, in which case the library will allocate it for you, uh, or you can set the size and then pass your actual buffers, uh, allocate the buffers and pass the buffers yourself. Um, and uh, so to, to we realize that this requirement may be a problem for, for many users. So we implemented in-place type conversion uh, where the library does the type conversion inside the uh, the you know the app application buffer the read or write buffer passed to HRD read or HRD write. Um, <clears throat> so by doing this, you el eliminate the need for a separate buffer, a separate type conversion buffer, and eliminate the need for for extra memory. Um, but uh, there are some some caveats to this. Uh, so the memory type cannot be smaller than the file type because obviously the the, uh, the IO buffer is sized by the memory type, and if it, it can't hold the file type, then we can't do type conversion in there because it needs to, it needs to be able to hold both. Um, uh, also, I didn't put it here, but also this uh, we don't use the background buffer for in, in place uh, at all right now. Um, so if you if your type needs a background buffer, then right now you, you just need a full size background buffer. Uh, and uh, the uh, the selection within each chunk or contiguous data set uh, needs to be contiguous. So the the examples from earlier, uh, these this selection would not work with uh, in place type conversion because this selection is not contiguous within each chunk. And if you're doing a write operation, because we need to be able to modify the uh, the write buffer, because we're we're 
changing the bytes around to do the conversion, uh, you need to explicitly say that you're allowed to modify the write buffer with this HIP said modify write buffer write buff uh, call because otherwise, uh, you know, we if you don't call this, you know, the library does not modify the user's write buffer data as sort of like a, a core uh, principle for for IO in general. Um, so we're, we're we're making you call this to explicitly say yes you can you can do this you can modify the write buffer even though it's passes const and even though we don't normally do anything with the write buffer in this case we can to allow uh, to allow us to save memory uh, and of course that means that if you write uh, if you call a, a HID write or with uh, a DXPL that has this property set then after the write call or, you know, then you cannot, uh, you can have to assume that there's garbage in the write buffer. Uh, yeah, you don't want to assume that there's anything useful in the write buffer because there probably isn't. Um, and so the, this, uh, the eligibility of, for in-place type conversion is determined on a chunk by chunk or contiguous data set by contiguous data set basis. Uh, so it's possible that some will allow it and some won't. Uh, so by this way, you know, it's not like one, if most of the selections are contiguous, but there's one chunk where it isn't, it's not like it's going to, uh, to torpedo the whole thing. Uh, it'll only make, you only need to have a type buffer large enough for the, for the chunks that don't have a contiguous selection. Um, and so... And again, if if, if the uh, I, I realize this is a lot, but if if it doesn't, if the buffer ends up not being big enough, then it'll just fall back to sort of independent scalar I/O. Um, <clears throat> and there is a way to check. Uh, I'll talk about it a little bit later. Should probably should have had a slide specifically to it, but uh, yeah, there's a way to check to see if uh, if it actually did selection I/O. Um, or actually, okay, so the in this case for the collective type conversion, uh, you can check, you use the existing HIP get no collective cause to check to see, or HIP get actual IO mode to check to see if it was collective. If it's not collective, you can do the HIP uh, get no collective cause, see if, there, if uh, why there wasn't collective and if the no collective cause is there's a new a new uh field that's uh a new possibility that's like uh um the no collective cause is that you didn't use selection io uh and it, in that case you can go and use this new uh api function hip get no selection io cause to see why there wasn't selection io uh and then there's uh if you go go to the documentation for that function it'll be a bunch of different uh you know uh, bit flag re reasons in this no selection IO cause. And, you know, one of them is type conversion buffer too small. And another one is back background buffer too small. All right. Uh, so <clears throat> right now, the, the file drivers that currently implement selection IO are the built-in MPIO driver, or actually all these only implement vector IO. So I don't think we have any... Uh, any that actually support selection IO that are, you know, in production right now. Uh, but we are working on that for the MPIO driver. So the built-in MPIO driver supports vector IO right now. It'll, you know, build the MPI data types inside the file driver instead of inside the uh, library using the, the vector, uh, vector parameters. Uh, and then there's a new subfiling driver that was introduced in 114.0 that also uses vector IO. Uh, and then the uh, the CCIO uh, custom collective IO driver under development at Argon uh, also uses vector IO. And uh, so here are the new select uh, new API functions. Uh, some of them there's uh, this main func one HIP set selection IO to turn it on, HIP get selection IO to see if it's on, HIP get no selection IO cause I talked about earlier to to tell you why. Selection IO wasn't used uh, on the uh, DXPL. Um, and HIP set modify write buff. Again, that I talked about earlier that uh, instructs the library that it's allowed to modify write buffers. 
Uh, and then these are sort of the new uh, low-level file driver uh, API functions, where if you want to just uh, pass a read or write call directly to the file driver, you can use these and uh, to pass a low-level vector or selection IO uh, command to the file driver. And uh, so in the future, what we want to work on that's related to this is we want to implement the selection IO callbacks in the MPIO, MPIO driver. Uh, it, and eventually we want to work towards you know replacing the the legacy back channel uh mpio pathway with only using selection io uh and also sort of open up collective to third party file drivers uh and it'll allow the uh third party file drivers to say uh i can be collective and then and then the library can do the Treat it as a, a collective file driver, even if it's not the built-in MPIO driver, which is you know the only way it's supported right now. Um, and then uh, we also want to implement selection and vector IO in more places in the in the library, such as compression, uh, chunk cache, uh, other places in the metadata cache, such as if, if you're if you're just writing a bunch of things, flushing a bunch of objects at once, uh, even if it's not collective and uh page buffer uh etc uh so yeah that was a lot of info but any questions can you remind me if you use um the right buffer allow the right buffer does that work with filters did we implement that with that it works with filters um so right now modify right buff it only yeah, we haven't implemented that with filters. So in the future, right now, that only that's only used by the library in the case of in-place type conversion for selection or vector IO, vector IO. But in the future, we might use that setting for things like filters, uh, mm -hmm. and we could we could use it for other cases for type conversion. Okay. So that's why I say in in the uh, in the documentation for it, any write call you make with this turned on. Uh, after the call, the right, uh, the contents of the right buffer are undefined. So, any other questions? Uh, I have a question about uh, the difference between select the IO, uh, vector IO, and the hyperslab selection. All right. Um, so, uh, vector IO is just offsets lengths and buffers so uh there there are no hyper slab selections or any other type of selection in vector io uh so so here uh like i said the 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 addresses array would be uh so if these started at zero then it'd be so this 10 so say it's four uh four byte integers so it'd be zero 40 80 uh, 120, 160, then over here, it might might skip up to, I don't know, 300, 340, 380. Uh, and then let's see, the sizes would all be, it would be a, every every element of the sizes array would be 12. And then buffs would be, uh, again, it depends on the shape of the memory buffer, but if it's the same size and it, it you know, be, you know, a hexadecimal value starting at something, but that would be offset by 0, 40, uh, 80 and so on. Whereas with selection IO, uh, you're passing uh, <clears> HDF5 <throat> uh, data spaces. So in this case, it would be a hyper slab uh, with, uh, you know, start zero, zero, uh, stride, zero, zero, count, uh, five, co or comma, three, uh, block, zero, zero, or one, one. Uh, and so it would, you know, the, and that would be the case for file and memory space, you know, if, if the memory buffer is the same shape as the file extend. Um, and so, yeah, I guess one, the quick way to answer is that the hyper slabs are only passed as hyper slabs for selection IO and they're just, and they're broken up into a series of contiguous blocks for vector IO. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, but I will be uh, 
it will be more helpful if I can see some example code uh, to to get a hands on. Right. Um, example code uh, from in in what sense that like for the file driver or I'll use these uh, new APIs. Oh, the new APIs. Yeah, and and I can I can see uh, whether I can do the same thing using select uh, selection IO vector IO and hyperslab. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm guessing one of the API is a subset of the other, right? Um, it's not the case. So are you are you writing a file driver or uh, are no? You... I'm just as an application user. Yeah, is it for from the perspective in, of an application user? Um, so you don't need to worry about these functions. I just put these for completeness, and almost nobody's going to need to call these. Um, so it's really these four, um, and this one at the top is the main one. So, uh, but if if you're just uh, just wanted. Uh, yeah, so I mean, you might not need to do anything. It might just turn it on automatically. But if you're, uh, I, I guess, uh, I guess the, uh, <clears throat> are you trying to use collective IO? No, I just want to understand uh, how to use this new API properly. Uh, right. Um, I would well, say read, read the, yeah, sorry. I would say read the reference manual entries, uh, but mostly if if you want to use selection IO, all you have to do is call this one with selection IO mode on. And then if you're doing type conversion, you need to make sure that the the buffer is large enough or you can do in place. Uh, and, and also you you also mentioned that there's a limitation uh, that the data set it is chunked. And it will fall back to use independent IO. Is this is the case? If the data set is chunked, yeah. um, are you talking about? You mean if the chunk cache is used? No, the data set is they are uh, the layout is defined as a chunk layout, and in the first bullet here is saying the data set is not contiguous or chunk. Right. So these are cases that that break selection IO. So if the data set is contiguous or chunked, it can still use selection IO. Okay. So yeah, most data sets are going to be contiguous or chunked. So so in most cases this will not break selection IO. Yeah, I'm thinking about a scenario like um because MPIO required the the file offset to be monotonic and not decreasing. Right. But chunks, uh, is, the location of the chunks in file is determined by HDF5 may, may not be right. uh, in a, a, any order at all. So uh, I, I'm wondering the in, internal implementation, what, what, would that be a sorting to make yes, sure we, that? Yeah, okay. right now this, the, for the legacy path, the sorting is in the library and uh, and for the uh, I actually, I believe in, in including for the vector IO callback, it does the sorting in the file driver and the upcoming uh, selection IO that we're working on. It also do the sort sorting in the file driver. OK. Thanks. Yep. But yeah, for, from the perspective of application developers, uh, you don't need to worry about it too much. I guess it's mostly the benefits and requirements. So if if, uh, if you're using a file driver that supports selection or vector IO and gets a benefit from it, or if you're using the MPIO file driver and you want collective type conversion, uh, then you want to sort of pay attention to the requirements and you can use uh, this these functions to sort of make sure it's actually turned on. Th these functions and the, uh, you know, get uh, actual IO mode. Uh, we're, we're planning to introduce a function that's get, HIP gets actual selection IO mode to tell you explicitly if selection IO is on or off, but you don't actually need that to get everything you need. You can just check to see if collective is on or off, basically, because that's what you care about 
for in in the M MPIO case at least. Well, in uh, in case that you have to fall back to independent I/O, even the user said uh, collecting mode. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a way to know the the real collective or independent I/O mode is used for a particular write operation or read operation? Right. Yeah. So there there are existing APIs for that. Uh, there's uh, there's HIP get uh, let's see. Um, I don't know if you can read this. Uh, yeah, okay. I forgot the I forgot the name of it, but there are, there are functions. Uh, uh, it's something like an actual uh, I/O mode, but it, apparently that's not exact. It might be get actual mpio or get mpio actual I, I don't remember but it's uh there's functions to tell you whether it it was performed uh independent or collective and also uh you can also set like collective but independent low level and i believe you can get whether that happened and uh there's also to check to see if it was link chunk or multi-chunk uh yeah, there, there are a few different functions to, to tell you how the I.O. was actually performed. Uh, okay, I will check them out. Yeah, get. Okay, yeah, here we go. HIFP get MPAO actual I.O. mode. And HIFP get MPAO actual chunk opt mode. So you should look, uh, look at those. Um, and then... Again, you can see that if it if it fell back to independent, even though you selected collective, then there's uh, HIP get MPO no collective cause here, which will tell you why. Uh, and then that cause might be because no selection IO. And in that case, you can use a new HIP get no selection IO cause API. All right. Here's it. All right. Uh Another question about setting the uh, uh, buffer for type conversion. Is it is it a way that uh, it, just to make a user job easier to just say, uh, I don't care, I, I, can I specify unlimited space, like a, like a predefined constant and pass it along when we call that function? Um, well, I mean, uh, you would probably said you could just set a very large number for the size. Okay. Uh, okay. Guess. Yeah. But but be aware that the library might try to allocate that much space. I I guess for uh for for the data type, I think the upper bound is the size of the the uh the data set. Probably right. times uh uh if it's upscale, then probably times two or four or something. Uh, you don't need to, to multiply it, but you do need to make sure that it's the size of the data set in the larger of the memory or file type. Mm. Okay. All right, thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Uh, Neil, uh, I, had, I had a question. Um, is it selection IO that increases the testing time when building the release, or am I thinking of something else? Uh, in, increases the testing time when building the release. Uh, yes, to pass the acceptance tests that are that are built in uh, when you're when you're building the the release of HDF. Well, there's a there's a new test for selection IO, so that that increases the testing time. Uh, I mean, every every new feature has a test and adds testing time. Uh, it, 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 are you talking about a, a recent like? Uh, Substantial increase in testing time. Yes, this was covered on a couple of call the doctors ago, but I, I I wasn't sure exactly what it was. But it doesn't sound like it's the selection I/O feature that that had increased the testing time on the one point fourteen. Right. I know there was I I know there was like one or two, uh, like some some of the the labs computers took an exceptional amount of time on the new multi data set test. Uh, and I don't think we were 
clear on exactly why that was, but I don't know. Is is Scott on this call? Uh, yeah, I don't know if someone else is on this call that might know more about that than me. But it might have been the multi data set. Okay, but right. it, it's not. So it's, it's selection IO no. is definitely not not it. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, it might have been selection IO. I don't. I don't know if it was a selection IO case in the multi data set. Um, because yeah. you know, selection is kind of integrated into the library, and it is used in some cases, even if it's not a selection IO specific test. But it, yeah, I, I don't know. Yes, no, I think this had to do with. It sounded like maybe the testing was heavily randomized, and that was the way that the testing was done. So mm -hmm. um, okay, so so it's it's not selection IO uh, because mm -hmm. you would know that immediately if it, if it were because the 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 increase in testing time was marked it was it was very significant mm -hmm. so okay all right thank you right. anything else all right thank you so much neil for jumping in that was a really good presentation Thanks. Um, Next week is a fifth Tuesday, so Gerd will be the presenter. Um, so tune in then, and I'll try to post ahead of time his content on the forum. Thank you, everyone. Hello, I have a question. Sure. I wasn't sure that you were ending, whether or not you were ending. I didn't, I didn't have a specific question for the presenter, but I had a question for HDF, somebody from HDF. Sure, we still and, have a few people on here. Okay, um, I'm a newbie and I'm trying to just open an HDF4 file and I can't seem to get any software to work to do it. And I was hoping that maybe somebody here that is a helper could help me with that at some point, not right now, but sometime in the future, like we could get together and he, could, he or she could walk me through how to do this. Sure. Um, is that something that can you, happen? Yeah, have you emailed help at hdfgroup.org? Um, no, I have not. I thought maybe talking to somebody in person like this would be more effective. So if I need to do that, I will go to help to the HDF uh, help thing and see if anybody uh, contacts me. The, the I forum would probably be useful. So go ahead. The forum would probably be useful. But in general, I mean, the HDF view should be able to open an HDF for file for you. Right. And I have, I have gotten that on my computer and I open it. And when I go to open an HDF4 format file, it crashes. And so I don't know why the software is crashing and I can't seem to get um, R to open an HDF4 file. And I have done a little bit of Python, but it's been a long time. And so I, before I dug into that and tried to relearn Python, I thought I might um, just to ask some people if there was an easier way uh, to go about doing it. And where this HDF4 file came from? Do you know who, who produced it? What data is there? Perhaps. Okay. Um, the one uh, ones I'm trying to open are, I, I don't know who actually produces them. Maybe NASA, uh, maybe NOAA. I'm not sure who does the, it's the multi-angle implementation with atmospheric correction, uh, MAIAC data files. But uh, this, is, this is something, this is the one I was just trying to do today. But this happens with, I, I, I'm unable to open any HDF4 file formats. And so then I try to go to HDF4 to convert to HDF5 and that software doesn't work. And so I try to open an HDF5 and, and try to see if I can get something from using HDF5 to backwards open an HDF4 and that won't work. So I'm kind of at a loss of how we're supposed to be able to open HDF4 files. So have um, you tried like- works. So I was, I was hoping to find something other than HDF. Um, Maybe somebody has another idea. I, I'm just I'm desperate here to see if anybody has anything other than HDF. <clears throat> well, if you do contact help, I mean, send an email. Do include the file name, uh, yeah. Because if it's a NASA satellite data file, yeah, um, then we work with those quite a lot. And so, uh, yeah, and, and I try to follow. Where the do you? Where do you? You know, just tell us where do you got it. Maybe did you download it from somewhere or everything else? Just, just include. The I get it off the DAAC, the distributed distributed atmospheric something or other. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I get confused with LADS and DAC and all these different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't who know who's running behind these things. I don't know how they're how they're connected. And I try to follow the instructions uh, for downloading and installing. And I, I don't use Unix. I use Windows. And so all these command line things are kind of blowing my mind. I've done a little bit of command line. 
but I, I don't understand all the options they add at the end. And I just don't, uh, the instructions are just not clear to me because I just don't have enough experience. Um, I keep telling you guys, people use Windows, it's a thing. <laughs> if you if you want if you want just regular people to use the data and the, it needs to be in Windows. If you want power users only, then stick to Unix. But can you, can you create else, a post on the forum and and have a link to where you got the data? And yeah. Well, I yeah. take a peek at it. Okay. Did you say you, you tried just like the sample HDF four files that were on on our website? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Okay, I thought. The HDF view should come with some sample files. Do those open? Well, so here's where you get where we're getting into the situation where I don't understand the instructions. I uh, I I see there's a whole bunch of things on this on the site, and I try to download the software. I don't know how much the other things I need. I just don't know enough about it. I really don't. Uh, so no. no, I didn't I didn't try to download those. I I I will go back and do that. Um, but I. Didn't figure that would be any different from trying to open an HDF four from somebody else. I just don't know, but yeah, I can try. So, that. so let me understand. So, you're a scientist that tries to use NASA data. Am I correct? I am a government employee who does scientific uh, analysis. Yes. All right. Okay. But I don't um, have a I don't have a whole bunch of background in 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 opening satellite files and and programming in Unix and things like that. I've done some Python and some R, SAS in the olden days. I would I would suggest to you email to help desk uh, okay. whatever is the email someone drops okay. that I think forum to register to get a username to go through all this I think it's a bit of a hassle. Yeah. Um, email us on this. Lori, can you drop the email? Uh, and uh, yes, there you go. And and include as the phone butter. name. Gotcha. Okay. So that we know we we will recognize where this file came and whatnot and then we'll we'll take it from that. Yeah. Okay. I'll take it from there. Fantastic. You guys have been helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye everyone.